Good afternoon, uh, viewers. Um, welcome to the agenda. We are talking to Timurukweni Naoyoma, who also goes by the name of D. Is it okay if I call you D? Yeah, yeah, that's the perfect uh, <laughs> way to address me. Okay. We are still young. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, D, you are men of the moment. Uh, I saw you making headlines in the newspapers mm -hmm. recently for some or other snubbing. Uh, AR movement uh, assemblies and okay. uh, activities. Yeah. But uh, before we go there, can you please tell us um, about yourself and how you ended up being into activism? Thank you very much, Delaney. Uh, you're men of the moment, I don't think so. Uh, <clears throat> because I, I think uh, Dimbolukeni is just a young man who is 30 of age. You know, people are always scared to speak about their age. So I'm 30 years old, okay. uh, two years born after independence. Um, Grew up in a village in Odibo, uh, but I was born in Katutura, Katutura Hospital. And then uh, I think by the age I was maybe six months or, or a year, I went to my grandmother to visit. And uh, she decided, no, she's going to take care of me because I was the first uh, son from her uh, first son. It's like the first grandson from the son, so that, that, that hierarchy. So she had to keep me. And uh, my aunt who took me there kept explaining to my mother that the child is coming, the child is coming. Eventually, I stayed um, and eventually came to Ventuk, uh, proceeded with primary. And then, uh, yeah, I joined activism quite at an early age because I think in my entire life, since primary to um, high school, and eventually when I left high school, has always been a life of activism because we'd always taken up spaces of leadership uh, always taken up spaces to champion the causes of others uh, we've always been at the forefront of ensuring that the social justice whether it was contextualized then of course uh, it, you would now when you look at it you in, in context you say but that was really activism G give me an example um, of how as a, a young child you got into activism or I mean, activities that you got up to you see we we we, we grew up uh, looking after ukombwena mm -hmm. and then if one is missing uh, you must account for it mm -hmm. uh, and then you through kettle heading really gives you uh, some sort of in initiation on leadership and accountability and uh, that is where our background really begins from and i remember we were in primary then uh, in a topland it's odibo combined school where the teacher wanted to punish the school, the class you know for because of one person uh, wrongdoing and we had to sit detention but before we said the detention we had to confront that issue with the teacher and say but why must we be punished for things that we have not contributed to. I think it was one or two who were making noise, so then it became a collective punishment. And of course from there we, we stood up for our rights, to say we can't be, but of course, a schooling system in the, in the villages is a different system, because you, the teacher knows all of us in our house, households. I can hear you guys. So does this mean we need to restart? No, no. Mm. Just continue. We'll have to cut it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when the teacher knows the whole household, it also gives her or him an opportunity to discipline us. So we come from that background where people really do that. And of course, uh, we st we joined at a very early age uh, the essential politics of uh, the Swapo Party Youth League. And we started championing community issues um, at a very, very young age. I think I was about 16 uh, when I actively started with the Swapo Youth League. What type of community issues were you looking at? We, I come from a location called Okuriangava. Um, and you would know that in Okuriangava, uh, there's a specific section that had electricity and one spec section that doesn't have. So we found ourselves at the middle there. Uh, where a lot of people needed to have acquired services. And also you see that this uh, gender-based violence uh, issues are really 
affecting our people who are living in corrugated iron sheets. And those were some of the issues that we brought to the forefront. Uh, issues of young people having access to libraries. Uh, we only have uh, two, one. The second one is not really a library, that's a stop and shop. We only have one that is at Maholili Center. So those were some of the burning issues we are addressing, uh, issues of sanitation. Um, and of course, uh, we started speaking frankly and truth to power where it didn't sit well with some of the leaders within the district uh, and eventually uh, the ascended national character because when you speak about sanitation and uh, we speak about people who are in the villages who are still using the bush, we concentrate on the village and neglect the informal settlement because they are in the cities. Mm -hmm. And these are the mostly affected people because they are the ones who are prone to hepatitis E, they are the ones who are prone to all other diseases that come with that uh, type of environment. So coming from that background of the informal settlement, uh, particularly because even as we never had access to water, we had one tip as a community uh, that we used to go to and we used to contribute to that. When people speak about uh, Sheikh Dweller Foundation, we exactly know the history because people used to collect uh, eventually after we've managed, my parents had managed to put up a structure, people used to collect those $1 and $5 behind our house. So we know the history. They, some of them have now moved to Ochomwise. They started Ochomwise, I think, seven the land. Some of them uh, moved to other parts of, of Vinduk. But that is the background that we come from, uh, of people who are downtrodden, the people who are dejected by the system, and the people who are oppressed uh, by the freedom that they voted for. OK. So uh, it's about eight years ago now, as we speak, uh, this week, where the AR movement started sort of gaining traction, uh, um, hitting the headlines and all of this. The, does that mean that um, you felt Swapo was not doing enough as a, as, a, as a youth activist at the time for you to start creating an alternative uh, sort of vehicle to address these challenges? Well, uh, thank you, Teleni. Exactly today at about 6 o'clock uh, in the morning, it's when we, I drove from Okurangawa, uh, picked up my colleagues, um, and then we picked up some journalists, others drove there, and we drove to Kline Kupe. Now, the central idea around the clearing of land at Kline Kupe, uh, we've explained it numerous times, but I think it's also important for us to give it context, is that we, when we were in the Youth League, and we were champ by youth league. You mean Swapo youth Swap league? Yes, the Swapo Party Youth League. Uh, we we, and you'd see that a generation of uh, uh, the 2012 leadership, mm -hmm. and prior to 2012, that leadership that got in was a very young leadership mm -hmm. that had ideas around economic emancipation and, and genuine economic freedom in our lifetime, mm -hmm. and it's a concept coined to look at how do we surpass flag independence. And how do we ensure that there's tangible economic emancipation for young people in particular and Namibians in general? So that those ideas meant that we needed to confront uh, elder youth and the uh, leaders who were in the party, some of them that were uh, benefiting, emancipating themselves through corrupt activities, but also speaking truth to power. Mm. And the Swapo party, when it went to uh, plan, when it went into uh, exile to fight, one of the central points was about al around the question of land. And you'd realize that around the same period of October leading towards November in 2014, mm -hmm. there has been a lot of dirty, underhand dealings of land sales in the city of Winduk, where the councillors passed resolutions around them getting land first, and immediately after they get it, they sell it to their friends you'd realize that at the same time, it was when the Delish won this big brother. Mm -hmm. And there has been people who have been on the city of Windhoek list since 1998. And in, in just after winning, mm -hmm. land is already allocated. So there was this preferential treatment to Namibians who could just, because of political connection or whatever um, fame you had at the time, you have access to these resources that other people who are not known with not uh, famous names, uh, did not have access to. So it, we needed to demonstrate and say, this land question is not just a by-the-way issue. 
And it's a serious issue that affects young people. It's an issue that also affects old people because at the time you're looking at somebody who has been about 20 years on a waiting list without any form of communication or without any form of list to say, yeah, you are now sitting at number 100 or where we are sitting in terms but of what, arrangement. Was there, was there no constitutional means of doing raising this awareness and causing calling for action rather than grabbing land because that's that's what the swap party yeah. leadership accused you of yes uh, 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 in, in fact land grabbing in fact what we've done successfully was champion these causes from within and like i said leading up to 2012 leadership that took over the Youth League. Mm -hmm. There has been those constant calls. And I, I tell you now, I've joined the Youth League at the age of, uh, I think, 15, 16. Mm -hmm. That's when I actively started participating in those meetings and speaking towards where I'm coming from, which is the informal settlement, mm -hmm. where people have been uh, staying in Babylon, a land a, a area that has been surveyed in 1998. Mm -hmm. And there has not been any tangible services there was no program to save us, and it allowed everybody just to start occupying. Mm -hmm. And remember when we said that freedom of movement, there hasn't been any tangible plan from the city of Vinduk to say, how do we cap mm -hmm. the mushrooming of uh, corrugated iron sheets and houses? How do we, how do we cap the, the growth of the informal settlement? How do we contain and work towards a plan? that is able to ensure that there are services that are brought to these people? You must realize that when there's a road contractor, that is assigned to develop a road in Vinduk. Mm -hmm. Eventually, people must come from somewhere to work on that road. So when they come and they set up a structure, eventually it was just for that road, which is 12 months. Mm -hmm. After the 12 months, this person gets another. So it becomes a payment, and then they invite their other relatives to come and stay there. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't any clear direction on how to deal with this. That is one. Two is the fact that there are also people who said, OK, I've acquired a knowledge under the light of a classroom. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I know there is a process for me to apply. Mm -hmm. And they've done that application. But there has not been any response. So we, we have been championing and speaking about these things.